A group of lawyers is defending religious freedom and Christian rights globally. It's called the Alliance Defending Freedom, and it's present in the courtroom and in legislative activity. ADF, as we call it, Alliance Defending Freedom, was founded uh, for one reason, and that was to keep the door open for the spread of the gospel, defend life, and defend the family. Prior to the founding of, of ADF, um, the left uh, was well organized in the courts and in the institutions of governance. And basically, there was no organized opposition by Christians, uh, Catholics and Evangelicals. Um, the other side was racking up victory after victory, having the cross banned from public schools, uh, having prayer banned from public schools, um, and passing uh, you know, Roe v. Wade in the United States, uh, the law that, or the, the case that uh, legalized abortion. Our side didn't show up. That's why we were losing, and that's why ADF was founded. We've grown. We have about 50 lawyers altogether, 200 employees, and we have offices um, in New York at the United Nations, in Washington, D.C. at the Organization of American States. We have our, our, our uh, basic office, our, our home office is in Arizona, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. We have offices, uh, again, in, in, in Mexico City, uh, again, to work in Latin America. And we have allies throughout the world. We have an office in Delhi, India. Uh, and we have a number of lawyers in, in, in India working for us. In addition to these currently existing locations, ADF is now embarking on a project to establish and grow offices across Europe. What happens in Europe impacts the world. Uh, when there's a ruling by the European Union or the European Court of Human Rights, which is the most important international court in the world, that has ripple effects, not only across Europe, but across the world. And we know that we can never have enough lawyers to win every single case. Uh, we need to focus on the institutions of international governance, have victories there. For example, if we have a victory at the European Court of Human Rights, we impact the law of 47 nations. If we have a victory at the European Union, stopping abortion, stopping same-sex marriage, stopping discrimination against Christians, we have a victory in 28 nations. Some laws stifle the Christian drive to bring the message of love of the gospel under the pretense of freedom and tolerance. We have lots of challenges, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, things like uh, the attack on the church. Uh, for example, um, Denmark is ordering all churches in Denmark to perform same-sex weddings. Uh, well, what about a church that, that who, a Christian church, the Catholic churches that refuse to do it? Uh, this is a direct frontal assault. Um, you know, the, the existence of hate speech laws and the use of hate speech laws against Christian expression. If a Christian tries to evangelize a Muslim, uh, that may be offensive to a Muslim, and hate speech laws are basically making it a crime to speak in a way that's offensive to the listener. Uh, if a Christian wants to speak against homosexual behavior, same-sex marriage, you may be prosecuted. The Pope and the Church have their part to play of being beacons of morality for society. We have to see clearly in what state the society is around us of which we are a part of, namely that the reality is quite different today. Then we have to say, departing from our convictions and believers, how can we pastorally approach the people and how can we be more fruitful, maybe more fruitful than in the last 30 years? We will have to see. It is interesting. Not all is rose and fine. And we can only hope that the church will pave the way and send a message. Who but the church? The church inspires also political debate.